welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we're we're excited about this uh, seminar series. I'm my name is Casey. I'm uh, operations director with Canyon View, and we are excited to have this seminar series. This is our start off for 2019. And if you haven't seen this poster, you're welcome to grab one to keep track of those throughout the this spring season. And you're welcome to come as many as you'd like. So we're, we're excited to uh, have this first one today and very excited to have Dr. Taylor uh, be our first speaker. Um, that's why you're here, so you know that. <laughs> and uh, we're excited to have him. Dr. Taylor's been at the Springville location for how many years? 20 years. So uh, he's been, uh, been serving the, the people of Springville and, and beyond for, for a long time. We're glad to have him here, so you didn't come to hear me, so we'll turn the time over to him and uh, give Dr. Taylor. So let's bring him out. Okay, and I, I get to wear the goofy headset, which is making me really self-conscious. And I apologize. Um, let me get my notes up here. So, um, uh, you know, as Casey mentioned, I've worked here in, in Springville for about 20 years. Um, I grew up in Spanish Fork, not very far away, um, and I'm a family physician here in Springville. Uh, and, um, you know, this, this talk is a little bit about what we know. Um, and as much as possible, it's what we call evidence-based. Um, it, in other words, it's common sense, but it's, it's backed up with a little bit of math. Um, and it's not a sales pitch. Um, I don't want you in my downline. Um, I don't have a magic pill. Uh, I, you know, you know I, don't, I don't have a fruit that I'm selling from some exotic location. I don't have an oil. I don't have that I, something I've just discovered in the South Seas. There's, there's no multi-levels to my pyramid. Um, and importantly, I'm not a researcher, okay? I'm, I'm a practicing physician. And so I freely admit that I have plagiarized all of my talk. Um, th this is a, a, a research study that I've done in my own practice, although I do have some anecdotes and some experience. Um, so I've looked at publications in journals. I've looked at uh, other doctors' lectures. I've, uh, I've even looked at TED Talks and uh, YouTube videos that I trust. And I'll sprinkle in a little bit of my experience. But, but um, you know, a, a lot of what I do at work is uh, I, lately I'm starting to think of myself as a Google guide, a guide to the Google, as my uh, father-in-law calls it. He always asks us to help him set up the Google on his computer. And because it, when I started this, there really wasn't a lot of information available to regular patients. There were big textbooks that were hard to navigate. There was the PDR, which was this huge book that told you what the, the side effects of drugs were. Um, and, and now, with just a few clicks on your thumb, you can find more information than you know what to do with. And a lot of it's bad. Some of it's good, and some of it's bad. And so a lot of what I do now in my job is to help people understand what good sources of information are um, and what fake medical news is. Uh, to use the, the, the current uh, term of the day. And, and I want this to be interactive. Um, I tend to blabber a lot. Um, and I am going to try to have um, save some time at the end for question and answers. So, so, so hold fast. And if you have some questions, answer them. If not, we'll talk after. So evidence-based medicine. So the question is, is what is that? Um, and it's, it, you know, to use some of the local vernacular, it, it's not celestial knowledge, OK? It's not even, or even, it's not right all the time. And in fact, it's often wrong. And that's the whole point. The scientific method, if you remember what your kid did in, in fifth grade science fair, is to have a theory and then test it. And in some ways, you hope that it's wrong, because then you correct it and you do better the next time. And, and that frustrates a lot of people, because I have a lot of patients that come in and say, well, last year you told us we were supposed to do this, and this year you told us that. So I don't, I don't trust you. I'm not going to do anything you say anymore. The truth is, is we're slowly getting a little closer to the truth with time. But that the scientific method means that we make mistakes on purpose. Um, and that's, that's how we get closer to the truth. So um, a lot of times people ask what I do. And if I tell you that, that I'm this guide to the Google, I suppose that's true. But the other thing that I do is, um, is basically I'm a Las Vegas bookie. That's really my job, OK? My job is to look at patterns, analyze things, and then tell people their odds and then have them help them make a decision. Um, I can't tell you for sure that if you do X and Y and Z um, that you can avoid A and B and C. Um, but I can tell you that the math tells you what your odds are. And then you can make a decision. 
And, and a lot of times it doesn't, the odds don't play out, right? George Burns, some of us remember him. Um, younger people in the room are looking at me with furrowed brows. Um, but George Burns was a famous comedian. He died when he was 100 years of old. One year of old, 100 years old. And he smoked cigars till the day he died. Yeah, he was always famous for having a big cigar. Jim Fix, um, that's somebody that some of you may know as well. Uh, Jim Fix uh, uh, started the jog, what we used to call the jogging craze. Jog, you don't use that term anymore, right? You don't say you go for a jog, you go for a run. But it used to be called jogging. And Jim Fix died while he was running uh, at the age of 52. So sometimes the long shot uh, kind of comes through. Some, sometimes, uh, you know, that horse race isn't won by the, 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 the horse that has the best odds. But smart casinos hire uh, good bookies to make sure the odds are ever in their favor, right? And so um, good science is based on large, well-designed studies, try to account for that placebo effect, and are honestly looking for the truth. But bad science tends to rely on anecdotes and tiny little studies. They're usually funded by somebody who's selling something. And it's hard to tell the difference. So let's talk first, healthy habits. So that title has two words, and we're going to tackle the first word first. So what makes us healthy, and what doesn't, and what does science tell us? This has been a frustrating journey for me, especially the last few days. If you paid attention to the news, um, the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, everything in the last couple of weeks, they've had articles about this. And even today, I was uh, on my, my lunch break, I was typing up a couple things and tweaking a couple things. And, and Casey, our, um, you know, one of our administrative staff came in and said, hey, you know, I was just listening to Science Friday. There's an article on the Mediterranean diet. And I was like, ah, because I don't have time to listen to that and then incorporate it into my talk tonight. <laughs> um, so we talked about and got a summary of it. And, and, um, and, and I was talking to Aaron, and, uh, our other practice administrator, and, and we were talking about something that he saw just in the news just today. And, there's tons of information out there. And this goes back to this principle of being a Google guy, trying to figure out what's real and what's not. We're going to start off with, with a common diet. In fact, USA Today uh, came out a couple days ago and said this was the number one diet in America. It's called the Mediterranean diet. Some of you may have heard about it. And, and it talks about eating primarily plant-based foods, um, whole grains, uh, nuts, replacing butter with olive oil, coconut oil, uh, supplementing with spices to both salt and flavored foods, uh, limiting red meat and enjoying meals with family and friends. If any of you have had the luxury of, gone, of going to Italy, eating there is a little slower paced. You go to a restaurant and they don't give you your food and hustle you right out. You're kind of expected to sit at the table and you know, kind of enjoy things for a while. Look over the piazza and people watch and it's kind of nice. And they also get plenty of exercise, lots of walks. And there's, there's, been, there's been a lot of evidence published that following that kind of a diet leads to fewer strokes and fewer heart attacks and longer lives. Um, but other research has, researchers have recently questioned the validity of some of the data associated with that Mediterranean diet. So now we're kind of confused. Um, just today I got an email from, um, I signed up for a, uh, an app that some of you may know about called MyFitnessPal. It lets you track your calories. It's commonly used, it's free, it's pretty good. Um, and it sends me annoying emails all the time. And one of the ones I got today was how intermittent fasting can help you lose weight. That's another big craze. And in fact, up at, up at the University of Utah and IMC, the IHC, uh, big hospital, the Death Star in Salt Lake. Um, I shouldn't say that, but that's what we call them. Not for bad reasons, just for, for amusing reasons. That's dark humor. Um, uh, but but uh, they're, they're doing some research on um, the possibility that it, it uh, decreases insulin levels and that, that intermittent fasting might actually be good for you. And, um, and yet, obviously, advising someone to fast intermittently might be bad for some people, people with diabetes. Certainly some people with tendencies toward anorexia. That's a really bad idea. Um, and there are tons of diets out there. Dr. Paxton is going to be talking about that in a couple weeks, about the difference between real nutrition and fad diets. Um, but there's keto. That's the current craze this year. Last year it was paleo. and A few years ago it was HCG, if you remember that. Uh, and I'm getting old. I've been practicing now for 20 years in this community. And it seems like I've got at least 20 or 30 different diets that have gone through the cycle. And some of them are even starting to recycle. Um, and obviously they don't work, right? Um, they just don't work. Um, so 
there's a lot of bad research out there. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know works. Um, you know, there are some studies that, that sound amazing. You know, there was one that I read that said that um, if you eat healthier, you manage stress better and love more. I love that. Um, that you have increased brain oxygen levels. I honestly don't know what the heck that means or even how they measured that. Um, it sounds cool, and it was really cool on a website, but um, there was another one that said that, that if, you, um, if you walk three hours a week for three months, it causes a measurable increase in your brain size. I don't know what that means. To me, an increase in brain size means cerebral edema and probably death. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's good. Um, there are other studies that show that, that if you increase blood flow to your skin, you're going to get more blood to your heart. They say that slows aging, slows tumor growth. Um, I've got some friends in the audience now, at least one who, who, if you're sick, I know what he'll tell me to do. He'll tell me to get on a bike and ride till I'm better. And, 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 and that seems to work for some people. Um, uh, you know, but we, we don't know. The Cleveland Clinic, um, which is kind of a prestigious organization, but also sometimes has some docs there that publish what I would call some squishy data. They tell us to drink a, a glass of water every day, for walk at least 10 minutes every day, go to bed a half hour earlier, avoid diet soda because it gives you a sweet tooth, engage in balance exercises, um, eat a healthy breakfast every day, eat fr fruits and greens with their meals. But again, there's not really any clear data on these things that, that's overwhelming. Um, and other organizations saying you should go offline, you should, you should do muscle strengthening, meditation. Uh, and a lot of these things pass the common sense truth. But what I'm saying is, is what we're really looking for is some evidence. We're looking for some math, something we can sink our teeth into. Um, I've had a lot of patients recommend a book called Younger Next Year. And I've looked at it, and it actually looks pretty good. Um, but it makes a lot of assumptions and, and makes a lot of promises. And I don't know if I would bet the farm on those things. So we get a lot of advice. Um, just today, I noticed a big article uh, pushing an app called the Johnson & Johnson 7-Minute Workout app with all, these, with all these promises that it would do amazing things for you. And maybe it does. Um, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm also suspicious. I've seen too much stuff get recommended by Oprah or Dr. Oz, my mother, uh, it, it, you know, some annoying aunt and a baby blessing who tells me something to do, and it turns out to just not be the fountain of youth. And you may argue, so what? What's the harm? And probably not much, um, but most of us don't want to waste time doing things that have no proof. And I guess what I'm saying is I'm lazy. Uh, I don't want to do something I don't have to do. And um, a lot of these recommendations tend to just overwhelm me. They make me feel bad because I can't do all these things at once. Um, and so I'm really looking for kind of that one silver bullet, that one thing that'll help. And so we're going to talk about something. We're going to talk about and some of you may have heard about this before. We're going to talk about blue zones. Uh, I wish I had a blue. The blue marker doesn't work, work very well. But um, blue zones are areas where people live significantly longer and better than the rest of us. And I know some of you are thinking, well, that's probably just due to genes. And, and in the age of 23 and me, where you can spit in a cup and know your whole genome, um, a lot of people might buy into that. But the truth is, as we start to look at how genes work, it's, it's not so much like a book of instructions that your body does, like code. It's more like a, a library that your body has access to. And what we're finding is that lifestyle activities tend to turn on some of those genes and turn off some other genes. So it may be that even though you, have, you were dealt a genetically bad hand, there are some ways to turn those genes off. And um, there was a, a study done, it's called, it's called the Danish Twin Study. Um, I don't think it's very ethical, but they, took, they, they looked, it, I don't think they could do this anymore, but they took, they took twins that were separated at birth. So they had the exact same genetic makeup, and then they followed them. And, and in, in a socialized country like, like uh, Denmark, they were able to do this and track them over time. And what they kind of figured out was that about 10% of our longevity comes from our genes, and about 90% comes from our lifestyle. So these blue zone researchers, uh, they've tried to help us figure out what elements of lifestyle are associated with longevity. And they worked with National Geographic. And so there are these beautiful pictures of these areas. It's really kind of cool to look at this stuff. And they asked what foods help us live longer. 
and what activities promote longevity? And what role does spirituality play? And what role does family and community play? And they, 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 they notice, and we all want to live to be 100, but they notice that only one in 5,000 people worldwide will make it to 100. That's just not realistic. But most of us should be able to make it to about 90. And yet the average life expectancy, at least in the U.S., is about 78. So we're leaving about 12 years, good years, good years on the table. But in the blue zones, these are areas around the world that they've identified, people live about, surprise, surprise, 12 years longer. Um, and about 10 times more of them make it to 100. And middle age mortality is dramatically less. So where are these places? Well, there's, there's a little few villages in an island of Sardini, Sardinia um, in Okinawa, and then a couple other areas that we're going to cover. So let's look at these areas. Uh, in this little island off Italy, it has, what, it has the oldest living male population. They primarily eat a plant-based diet. Um, they're not vegetarians, but they, they eat a lot of plants. And interestingly and, and tellingly, they treat old people differently. You know, in the U.S., if we pick the absolute perfect age, the age at which we idolize people, it's about 24. We're a Kardashian culture, right? And, and once you kind of go over that edge, we all get worried because we get wrinkles and we get bellies and, and it, it, things hurt. And we don't respect those people. We don't respect our elders. Well, in Sardinia, elders are looked up to. They don't have, um, you know, one, one of the guys who was giving a talk on this said they don't have a Playmate of the Month calendar over there. They have a Centenarian of the Month calendar. I'm not sure if he was being serious or not, but it was that, that was the principle. And they have these great photos of these people from this village. And they, they have... Um, they have a 100-year-old man beating one of the researchers in an arm wrestling contest. And they have these 100-year-old these guys riding scooters and fishing and working. Um, in Okinawa, that's where we have the oldest female population. They have very low uh, illness rates. People live a long time. They tend to just die in their sleep. They live seven years longer than the average American. And there's a one-fifth rate of breast and colon cancer than what we have one-sixth the rate of cardiovascular disease, and they follow a plant-based diet. Again, not vegetarian, but a lot more plants. They have a lot of weird traditions that encourage or discourage overeating. They don't have family-style meals. They serve their meals at a counter, and you fill up your plate. They put the food away, and then you go and sit on the floor and eat. They have small plates. They abide by this Confucian saying, and I'm going to butcher this because I don't speak Okinawan, but harahachi budai which roughly translated means you stop when you're about 80% full. 15 years ago, the average American had three good friends. Uh, the current data says we now have 1.5. Okinawan culture, by contrast, is organized around these friend groups called moais. And these are a group of five or six people that support each other their whole life. And a lot of these people stay in the same village that they, they were born in. And in, in this National Geographic spread, they have a picture of this five-woman Moai, um, and they've been together, best friends, supporting each other in their ups and downs for 97 years. They're all like 104, 105. In the U.S., we work and then we stop. We have two phases in our lives. Uh, in Okinawa, there's no word for retirement. They do have a word that we don't have. It's called ikigai, and it means the reason for getting up in the morning, which is a really cool word. And if you ask people, what is your icky guy, they know. Um, they have a purpose. And they continue to work. They continue to contribute. Um, you know, worldwide, the most dangerous time to be alive is the first year of your life because of infant mortality and the year you retire. Those are the top two times when people die. Um, we can't avoid birth, but we can avoid retirement. We could redefine it. And, and maybe you're just thinking, again, this is all genetics. We have these two isolated genetic zones, right? These cultures that have been around for 2,000, 3,000 years, isolated. They've inbred. Um, they just somehow won the genetic lottery. Well, let's look at the third blue zone. Um, this is based, and, and they got some good data. They based this on a 70,000-person study, and it was right here in the U.S. And it included uh, people who were black, who were Hispanic, who are white, and it's in Loma Linda, California. And you may say, why? That's bizarre. Well, that's where the Seventh-day Adventists 
are, are, are focused and or, or where they live, a large, large, large group of them. Um, and if you're familiar with Seventh-day Adventists, they, their Sunday is on a different day. It's on Saturday. And they have this 24-hour period of worship. And, um, and that changes a lot of things. The U.S. life expectancy right now is 80 for women, 76 for men, 78 on average, as I said before. The Seventh-day Adventists, it's 89 for women and 87 for men. That's nine extra years for the women and 11 extra years for the men. Again, they have a plant-based diet. They follow uh, straight, straight out of Genesis. They don't eat a lot of meat. And um, they, for those 24 hours, they focus on God. They focus on their social network. And importantly, incorporated into their religion are these nature walks that they take. They're active. One of, the, one of the, these photo essays, there was this great... There was this great guy that they talked about, and his name was Ellsworth Warham. He was 97 years old. He was a multimillionaire. Um, and he was given a bid for a privacy fence around his property, and they wanted $6,000 to build a privacy fence around his property. And he said, you know, for that money, I can do that myself. And so he spent four days out there digging holes, pouring cement, putting posts in, building the fence. And perhaps... Not surprisingly, he ended up in the operating room for heart surgery as the surgeon four days later because at 97, he does 20 open heart surgeries a month. So what's common in these blue zones? Um, and there are a few more that they've since discovered and published on. Well, four things. And the first one is a bad thing to say in this country. They do not exercise, but they move. In they have lives that are set up to nudge them into physical activity. In Okinawa, these 100-year-old grandmas, they get up and down off the floor 30 to 40 times. I do that once and my body hurts. Now, I'm not kidding. I'm only 51. Um, they go up and down stairs all the time. That village in Sardinia is built on a hill, and the houses all have stairs in them. And if you go out say, and, and want to borrow some eggs from your neighbors, you're walking up three or four flights of stairs to get to your neighbor's house. Um, when they bake, they use their arms. They, that's their kitchen aid. And these Seventh-day Adventists, of course, do their, do their nature walks, right? Uh, and, and, and they exercise with things they enjoy. They hike. They garden. Exercise is just part of their life. And I don't mean to slam this building that we're in, but, but again, these people don't need it because everything they do in their life involves activity. So that's the first thing. They move. The second, and there's four things, so it's not hard. One through four. The second one is they have the right outlook. Okay, they downshift. They have a purpose in life. They have an icky guy. They have a spiritual component to their life. They have traditions that give them lifelong purpose. That's number two. The third one is they eat wisely. They don't follow diets, but they eat mostly plants. Uh, they're not vegetarians, but 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 meat's not the centerpiece of their of their meal. Uh, you know, growing up in my mom's home, and not to beat up on my mom, but the plate is centered around your meat, right? You have your meat, and then everything else is kind of around that. That's kind of the traditional American food. You have meat and then stuff around it. That's not the way they eat. And they follow some variation of this 80% rule in the different cultures. Um, you know, the, the, the Okinawans have this harahachi budai thing that they say before they eat. Other people have another way of doing that, but they just don't overeat. They don't smoke, very importantly, and they don't drink to excess. And they connect. And I'm not talking about Facebook here. They put family first. Uh, they belong to faith or community groups, uh, either a Moai or some variant. Um, one of the elderly women who was in the Seventh-day Adventist Church said, a stranger is a friend I haven't met yet. Um, very open people. Interestingly, there is some very good data that belonging to a church or some sort of faith organization gives you between 4 and 14 years of extra life if you attend about four times a month. They have what's called the right tribe. Um, they surround themselves with people who are active, who eat right, who have a purpose, and who provide support. Um, so it's pretty clear that if you move right, if you have a purpose, if you eat wisely, and if you belong to the right tribe, you live longer and you live better. Now, Utah's not a pure blue zone. Um, you know, and this comes from a loyal Ute fan, hence my shirt. But we are more than a little blue. Um, Utah was recently ranked as one of the top five healthy, healthiest states for overall health in the U.S. Uh, behind Hawaii, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont. Um, 
that just came out just a, a month or so ago. And if you think about what do we do in Utah, we move naturally. There's lots of opportunities for us to be active. Um, we have a spiritual component to our lives. We have a purpose to life. Um, some of us eat wisely. Most of us don't smoke, particularly compared to our surrounding states, to Wyoming and Nevada, which are in the bottom uh, percent of, of that study. Our beer is only 3.2. Um, we connect with the right tribe. And that's perhaps what this Clyde Recreation Center is all about, is creating that kind of tribe that motivates us to do the right thing. Just yesterday, the New York Times published a study, um, or not a study, they published an article, and they suggested you remember four words for the new year, move, nourish, refresh, and connect, which are the same four things that are in the blue zones. It's just a slightly different thing. Um, and they've created something called a 30-day well challenge, and they, every day for 30 days starting on Monday, this Monday, you can look in the New York Times and they'll give you some sort of challenge that you can do that, that's science-based and would help you be healthier, that wouldn't be a bad thing to take a look at. So, um, but this is still frustrating for me because even good studies, you know, the American Heart Association did a study of 123,000 people over 34 years. Um, and, and their data suggests that you can get 10 years of extra life if you eat a healthy diet, which they define, very similar to the Mediterranean diet, get regular exercise, don't smoke, stay at a healthy weight, limit alcohol. Now, I don't have a problem with smoking and alcohol, but the other things are kind of overwhelming. Um, and again, I'm looking for that one thing. What could I do? What's the one thing I could do today? You know? And in my job, mainly, you know, this is embarrassing to say, but I mainly hand out pills. That's what I do. And I'm always looking for a better pill, right? I'm looking for that perfect pill. And, and if I had one pill, if I had one treatment that could give about a 50% reduction in arthri arthritis pain, a 50% reduction in a prevention of progression to dementia, if I had one pill that would give like a 60% reduction of patients who were progressing from pre-diabetes to diabetes, a 40% reduction in hip fractures in postmenopausal women, a 50% reduction in anxiety, 47% reduction in depression, 23% reduction in overall mortality, if I had that pill, I would give it to everyone. I would take it myself. And the cool thing is, I do. Because numerous studies now, overwhelming evidence shows that 30 minutes of walking every day does all those things. So again, if I'm going to say do one thing, it's that stupid track upstairs that I swear only goes one way and is giving my patients IT band syndrome because they always turn to the left. They, I know it switches. I know it switches. But it doesn't switch fast enough. It should switch every hour. I have issues with it. Um, there's a great short video on this. If you look up on YouTube, there's a video called 23 and a Half Hours um, by a guy named Dr. Mike Evans. And he goes through a lot of this research. And, and he reviews a lot of the solid re research on this stuff. And, and more than smoking, more than hypertension, more than cholesterol uh, correction, more than treating diabetes, correcting the problem of low fitness decreases our risk of dying. It's, it's dramatic. And it's also cool that... Um, that the research very clearly points out that if you're obese and you don't exercise, that's very, very dangerous. But if you're a little overweight and you get some exercise, you're, you're okay. Our goal is not to be on the cover of Shape Magazine or Men's Fitness. It's to get moving, whatever our body shape. Um, and there are some other large studies that show this. Um, a big Japanese company in, um, in the 90s, they were required by the government to monitor their employees' fitness, which seems a little big brotherish. I know we have, we have some employees, and I think they would be creeped out if we were looking at their blood pressure and their weight and, and a lot of things. That would be really weird. Um, but what they found is they looked at all their employees, and they looked at where they lived, and they looked at how far they walked to the factory. And they found that if you walked 10 to 20 minutes, each day, there was a 12% decrease in the rates of high blood pressure. If you walk 20 minutes, there's a 29% decrease in the rates of high blood pressure. And that continued to go up. For every 10-minute increase, your risk drops 12%. There was an interesting German study. If you're familiar what stents are in your heart, that's when you get a blockage in your heart, and they put this cage in there, and they open it up so that you can get blood to your heart again. And again, I don't know how they do these ethical studies, but in Europe, but... 
but they, they took people and they randomized half of them to stent placement and half of them just to exercise a lot. The people who had the stent, the year after they had the stent, 70% of them didn't have another heart attack. The people who exercised, 88% of them did not have a, re a repeat event. It turns out exercise was better than a $20,000 stent. Not something our drug reps want to hear. Um, and, and in the U.S., we do a little research here, um, and they found that frequent brisk walking is the only thing that's been shown to prevent progression of Alzheimer's disease and to significantly delay the progression of vascular dementia. That's dementia from strokes. So you put it all together, and you come up with what I tell patients at every, every doctor visit. So I draw this graph, okay? And, and what we find is that if we put on the bottom, if we put minutes per week of exercise, and that exercise has to be something that makes you just get a little out of breath. It doesn't have to be training for a triathlon. And depending on your fitness level, that could be walking a dog. You know, it really could. Or just, you know, running up some stairs. But minutes per week, and we, we plot this versus years, extra years, of life. Okay? And what we found, unsurprisingly, is if you exercise more, you live longer. And if you exercise more, you live longer. And if you exercise more, you live longer, and then it plateaus off. And that inflection point is 150 minutes per week, which surprisingly is about a half an hour a day, which is concordant with all of the other studies. And if we plot this over here, it's about five years of extra life. So the cool thing is, if you can get to here and stay here, and you've got that guy in your neighborhood who you're not sure has a real job but has a big truck and exercises like six hours a day and looks really big, he's over here, you both die the same day. You do. Okay? You do. Um, you know, and, and you can break this up into small increments, right? I've got a, a patient who's a BYU professor, and he parks on purpose down by Provo High School, and then he walks as fast as he can up to his office. And then at the end of the day, he walks as fast as he can back. It's 15 minutes up, 15 minutes down. Five days a week, 150 minutes. Anything else he does is gravy. Okay? So, part two. We talked about health. What's the one thing we can do? It's probably just walking. Now, there's other stuff you can do. There's lots of stuff in this building. There's lots of stuff in the grocery store. There's lots of choices you can make. We talked about those blue zones. We talked about the four different things you can do. But I would argue the most powerful thing is to exercise, to walk, to simply walk 30 minutes a day. So the second part um, is how do we, and we'll go through this pretty quick, but how do we create or change habits? Now, there's a disclaimer here because um, this gets us into a little bit of the squishy behavioral science, right? This isn't quite as much math in psychology, or it's harder to do. And, and it's interesting, though. There are some myths, okay? When, when you ask someone, how long does it take to make a habit? Um, the number comes up at 21, really common. And it's based on a book called, um, what was it called? Don't even tell me the name. Psycho-Cybernetics. It was published in the 50s by a guy named Maxwell Maltz. He was a plastic surgeon, and he noticed that when he did plastic surgery on someone, it took him about 21 days to look in the mirror and recognize that that was themselves. For, for about 21 days, they would look in the mirror and go, huh, that's not me. And then after 21 days, like, yeah, me. Um, and so he said, well, it takes about 21 days to change your brain. And then people ran with that and said, it takes 21 days to change any habit. And then after about 20 years, people decided 21 is an inconvenient number. 30 is a better number because that's a month. So it changed to 30. And so now when you talk to someone, they say, yeah, it takes 30 minutes to change a habit. And that's treated as gospel. But there's, there's no science behind it. So um, there was a woman named Philippa, Philippa, which is a cool name, Lally at the University College of London. And she examined this question about 10 years ago. And, and what she did is she got a bunch of people to pick a habit and then try to change their life and then report back every day on whether the habit had become automatic or whether they were still working on it. And what she found was, on average, it's about 66 days 
But if you're familiar with statistics, we don't just talk about the average, we talk about the range. The range was huge. It was 18 to 254 days. Um, and so the truth is, it almost takes longer than you think. And so the big message here is you need to cut yourself some slack. If you joined this fitness center three weeks ago and you're angry at yourself because you're not doing it every darn day and it hasn't become a habit yet, then you must be a horrible human being. No, you're just not. It takes a while. It takes a while. Um, so, and there, there's a habit cycle that we talk about. Um, there's something called a cue, and then that leads to an action, which leads to a reward, and then it just repeats over and over again. And if you want to try to work on this stuff, what you really want to do is you want to become a behavioral scientist, and you want to look at your own life and look at the dumb things that you do and try to identify those elements and try to make them better. Let me give you an example. Um, well, I typically get to work to every day at about 8 o'clock, maybe a little bit before, and I'm there till 5 or 6. And it's a long day. And, and that's okay because I love my job. It's fun. But because of the nature of my job, um, even on lunch break, I have to work. Um, I, I've got paperwork to do. I've got to answer messages. Uh, some emergencies might come in. And, and so I don't really get a break per se. And, and usually when I work, some of the people that I work with are here actually, and, and I stand out in the hall, and, and my desk's about this tall, and I, I do this, and my legs get tired. And, and so to get in a break, I go and I hide in my room. I have a little room way in the back of the clinic. But if I sit there, my computer stares at me, and I can just see the messages popping in. And, and, and so I've learned that to get a break, after I sit down for a couple of minutes, what I really have to do is stand up and wander away from my desk. But then I have to come up with a reason to, to wander the office, because that looks strange. And so I have to create these missions for myself. So I'm going to go to the break room and, 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 and get a treat. And, and so I start foraging. So that's the, I, and I've, I've, I've realized this, actually, over the last few days as I've prepared this talk, because I've analyzed myself. Um, so I walk to the break room. I walk to Lisa's office, who's in the back. She has this evil box of treats that she keeps there. Um, Dr. McClay has this drawer where there's treats are. If you're one of his patients, I'll show you where that is. Um, there's a dum dum jar over well at every desk, but a really big one over by Penrods. I don't know why he gets the biggest one, but I go around and and um, and I and I kind of go from treat to treat, and that gives me an excuse to be out and about, to be away from my messages, to socialize, to get a mental break, right? And and so the cue or the trigger has actually become sitting at my desk. I've started to notice that that every time I sit down with my computer on, I get hungry which is weird, isn't it? And the action is to stand up and wander around and forage for food. And the reward is relaxation or a break from work. And after conditioning myself for several years, and as I thought about this recently, this is generalized to other locations. In fact, it just happened tonight. I went home. I ate some dinner. So I'd just eaten. And I sat down on the couch with my little thingy in front of me, and I'm going through this talk for one last time. And as soon as I turned it on, without thinking, I was in the pantry. It happens. And, and, um, and, and I think I gained five pounds helping pre prepare for this talk. Um, so I want you to get curious. I want you to start thinking about the habits that you have that you want to get rid of. I want to, you to start thinking about the habits that you want to develop. And think of them in terms of this cycle, OK? If there's something you want to do, you need to make that cue easier. You need to remind yourself. If I ask a patient to take a pill, this sounds weird, but I tell them to duct tape it to their toothbrush so they remember, right? We look at the action that we want, and then we look at the reward and make sure that all of this is making sense and that it's working. And it's actually kind of fun to start to analyze your own life and figure out um, what's going on here. There w one last study, and then we'll, we'll kind of sum up with some things, and then we'll go to some questions. Um, but uh, there was, there was a, a smoking cessation clinic, and they had an unusual approach. They told people to smoke. They wanted them to actually smoke more. But then they asked them to get a yellow pad and a marker and write down what they were feeling when they smoked. And lights started to come on. And people started to say, I didn't realize how overwhelming my cravings were. They started to say, my mouth feels gross. They started to say, smoke actually smells bad. 
they started to say, I feel relaxed after smoking, but I think it's just because I'm not jonesing anymore. I don't, I don't feel the, the, the itch to, to smoke. Um, there, it, it's interesting. There are certain times when it's best to change a habit, and that usually is a time when a lot of your cues have changed. So people who smoke find that it's actually easier to stop smoking when they go on vacation. They're not at their house. They're not on their way to work. They're not in their car. Um, and Target knows this. And Target did, in, in, there's an interesting book recently that analyzed some of the things that Target does. Um, Target has, has registries for people who are pregnant. And they can register for gifts. And um, they have started to analyze people who shop at Target regularly and find out what they buy while they're pregnant. And then the cool thing is, or the creepy thing, is they backed that off and said, now we're just going to look at everybody that shops at Target. And it turns out they can predict who is pregnant and when they will deliver within two weeks of their due date based on when they buy things like unscented lotion and, and hand sanitizer and stuff that isn't even baby related, which is kind of freaky. And there was a funny story about that because they, set, they then target those people with coupons, right? So there's some 16-year-old girl who started getting a bunch of coupons for baby wipes and diapers, and her father called Target just furious. You know, why is my daughter being targeted every day with coupons for these things? And they said, I'm sorry, we'll have the manager call you tomorrow. We're so sorry. The manager called back, and the dad says, no, I have to apologize to you. I had to talk to my daughter. There are some things going on in our house I didn't know about. And she was pregnant. So how do we boil all this stuff down? Well, if we're going to say what to do, remember, remember I said walking is a good one. If you're already walking, then pick another of those healthy habits that we found out from those blue zones. But focus on one thing at a time. Don't try to do too many things. Take advantage of life changes. If, if you're in a position in your life where there's some big life changes or you're in a new place or you're moving to a new house, take advantage of those changes. Um, if the kids are moving, going back to school, the new year, take advantage of that. Commit for the long haul. It ain't 21 days. It's not 30 days. It might not even be 66. It's going to take a while to establish those habits. But give yourself some slack. You might mess up. If you do, get up and do, and do it again. Um, focus on small habits. There was a guy named B.J. Fogg out of Stanford, and he decided that he wanted to do 30 push-ups a day, and he was having a hard time doing that. So what he did is he told himself, every time I go to the bathroom, I'm going to do three push-ups. Pretty soon he was doing 20 to 30 push-ups a day, and, and he wasn't having to go to the gym. So little tiny habits make big changes. Um, focus on little changes. If you're having trouble getting up in the morning to exercise, start by just moving your clock back five minutes. For a week, get up at 6.55 instead of 7, and then move it to 6.50, and then move it to 6.45. And pretty soon, you've got some extra time that you can use for exercise. When I tell my patients to lose weight, I have a lot of people come in, they need to lose 30 pounds. I tell them, I don't want you to lose 30 pounds. It's three. And once you're down three, we're going to do it again. And then we're going to do it again. <laughs> and then we're going to do it again. Because if you, if you look at the big picture, that's more than you can bite off. you got to plan for obstacles. It is freaking cold out there. Um, and if your exercise plan is to go for a run every day in the morning, you've got a problem. And you've got to be really dedicated. Um, what if you get injured? Um, you know, what if, what if your there's some financial situations that change? You need to create accountability. So you want a friend group. Again, one of the reasons for having a social network. Um, you want an exercise buddy. You want somebody knocking on your door that, that makes you feel like, yeah, i got to get out of bed because she's going to knock on the door and we got to go walk. Um, Weight Watchers uses that to their, to their example. Create some cues, okay? Hang your earbuds by the door. Um, use apps. Turn on the notifications that we all help so your, your phone is beeping at you all the time, reminding you to do your push-ups or do whatever you do. And then make those rewards meaningful, small, and frequent. Setting up a reward that, that's going to reward you for losing 30 pounds six months from now is never going to work. But setting up a small reward that's going to kick in today will. A lot of times I tell my, my pregnant, or not my pregnant patients, patients who just had a baby, um, I tell them I want them to go exercise. I want them to push that stroller around. But I want them to do this before they leave the house. Or better yet, they leave the stroller home and do this. And then they look at their husband and say, I am off the clock. And they disappear for an hour. 
and they go for a walk, and they walk to the library, and they sit down in a chair, and they read a book. And sitting in the chair, reading a book, getting a break, that's their reward for exercise. And they start to associate those things. They start to associate relaxation, happiness with exercise. Um, so my challenge to you is to build a new identity. Get to the point where you can say, I'm a biker. I'm a hiker. I walk. I run. I eat well. I hide at the library and read science fiction. I'm somebody who doesn't quit. So remember, move, nourish, refresh, connect. Pick one habit, go after it, be curious about that cycle. Examine your life. You'll find some amazing things like I just did and just repeat it. And if we do that, I know we can be healthy. That's all I got. So. And I so um, we've got the room for uh, another 10 or so minutes. Does anybody have any specific questions or if you want to come on up and ask or anybody have any ideas? Yeah. It's a good question. The studies show that it's 150 minutes per week to reduce risk of heart attacks and strokes, right? But exercising a little bit beyond that um, does improve strength. It improves. Um, it, 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 you're not totally leveled off. That study was mainly for heart attacks and strokes, things that will kill you. Um, Quality of life is a very big, is different, you know, and, and there are a lot of people who really focus on quality of life, and, and I think that continues to improve as you exercise a little more, within reason. You know, once again, we, you know, we know some people who are, you know, mentally ill or something, and they're exercising 10 hours a day. That's weird. That's just weird. I'm sorry. That's weird. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. 23 and a half hours. So what, what his tagline is, is I want you to only sleep, sit, and watch TV for 23 and a half hours. What that means is for a half hour, I want you to get off your butt walk. That was kind of his little joke at the end of his, everyone did that. That's, that was the punchline at the end of the talk. So, other thoughts? Back. Can you get on this big story bike so say Sure. Is it just, that's the question, is it just walking? No. A lot of the studies have been done on walking because that's the most common exercise. Um, but um, I actually have some plantar fasciitis. My foot hurts. It hurts for me to walk a lot, and I don't run very well. Uh, and so, yeah, I disappear into the basement and get on my bike. Just makes you need your heart rate up. Yeah, the idea is doing something that makes you talk just a little like this. If you're doing that, you're there. For 30 minutes? For about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Or... 150 minutes a week. So if you play basketball for an hour, twice a week, and then do something else, yeah, that probably works. Um, so it can be aggregated, it can be split up. Again, the idea, what we learned from these blue zones, is that really we just need to be physically active. Uh, and I'm guilty of this myself. You know, uh, you know, I'm a member of the LDS Church and my, my ward is two blocks from my house. I can't remember the last time I walked to church, which is super embarrassing. Because I convince myself I'm late and I'm important and I gotta get there and you know I gotta teach or do this. That's dumb. I should walk. So if I were to pick one small habit, maybe that's it. Maybe that's I start, you know, saying, hey, look, I need to, you know, get out of bed five minutes earlier and walk home. That would be a better thing. Other thoughts, yeah. Okay, a big question. We don't know, to be honest. And again, a lot of the premises of the Mediterranean diet are being challenged a little bit right now. And again, that's not bad. They may be challenged, and we may find out that they're actually spot on. Um, right now, I wouldn't get caught up in the details as much, rather than saying, you know, maybe eating a whole stick of butter is bad. Um, and certainly margarine is bad. I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of that. I mean, I grew up when, you know, butter was the devil. And so instead, we ate this artificial construct called margarine, which turns out it's horrible. <laughs> Plus, it tastes really bad. My wife um, let me know what butter tastes like when we got married. My eyes, my eyes were open. My Depression-era mother never bought butter. So, so butter actually tastes a lot better. But, but you know, olive oil's not bad either. You know, if, if you get some bread, you cut up some baguettes, and you put some olive oil in, a little bit of a salt, and it's pretty good. 
for good. Other questions? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting, and, and some of that actually has come out of Utah, because people uh, up at IMC, the big hospital in Salt Lake, they noticed that, you know, for some weird reasons, people in Utah are a little healthier, and, and there's a lot of those, right? You know, Utah's a weird, a pe we're a peculiar people, right? And, and we're very much different than Nevada, so it's a very stark contrast. High smoking rates, um, low smoking rates, I mean, you know, there's some very big differences there. But one of the things that they started to look at was, well, maybe fasting once a month actually confers some physiologic benefits. And they've, they've started to look at some data, and again, these are small studies, and so I'm even hesitant to, to quote them. But there are some studies that show that people who fast intermittently have lower fasting insulin levels. You know, and, and so they're, and which may, which, which may portray a slower trend towards type 2 diabetes. And so they're looking at that, they're actually doing some studies, I think they were enrolling some people in the study up in Salt Lake. Um, and there are a couple strategies to this. There are some people who say, I'm only gonna eat during certain hours of every day. That's one strategy. They say, okay, I, I only eat 16 hours a day, or excuse me, eight hours a day, the other 16 I don't eat. And they do that seven days a week. That sounds kind of brutal to me, I don't like it. But then there's another one where they say, you know, I do what's called a 6-1 or a 5-2 diet, where one day a week, um, I keep my calories under about 600. And, um, and then the rest of the week, I just eat a good healthy diet, don't worry about it. Um, or I do that two days a week. And there's some, there's some data that that also confers some benefit. But again, we haven't studied it enough to know for sure. Those are super trendy diets right now, as evidenced by my little tweet from my fitness power. Not tweet, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what the tweet is. <laughs> right, we don't, and we don't know what the best pattern is. And it might be different for different people. You know, I'm always hesitant when somebody says it's a one size fits all, except with, with this 30 minutes of exercise a day. That's pretty much universal. And, and that was the magic of that Blue Zone research, is they really tried to find something that would translate across cultures, across people with different genetic makeups, people from different cultures. They really, really seem to hold true. Do the 30 minutes have to be all at once? No, no. Like, like that BYU professor I talked about. You know, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. Um, no. And, and, and again, if, if you can incorporate that or tie it into something else, let's say you make a goal that every time you go to the store, you park as far away from the front door of Walmart as you can. You know, you know all the way over by Mongolian Grill or whatever, whatever that place is. And, and, and you walk 10 minutes all the way to the front of the store. My mother does this. It drove me nuts the first time. But she shops at Macy's and she doesn't drive anymore, so we drive her over there, right? And one of the first times I took her over to shop, um, you know, she said, well, meet me by the bench in the front of Macy's. You know, so she gets her car and she's going off. And I go and sit at the bench and I'm looking at my watch. And, you know, it's been a long time. And so finally I'm like, maybe she needs some help. So I go and find her. She's over in Frozen Foods and her car is empty. And, and I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? And she's like, well, I do four laps before I start shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, good. That's good. I'll go sit down on the bench. You know, good for her. You know, so yeah. You mentioned uh, you know, the four elements. Sleep was not mentioned at all. Yeah, and, and again, these were the things that they found across cultures. And so I'm not saying there aren't other things that would really be helpful, because I, I, I think there are. Um, but as far as what we know now, that's what we know. And I'm hoping, expecting that that knowledge will expand. And we may find the optimal sleep pattern, that the right, the right amount of sleep to get for each person or, or for or people with certain genetic makeups. And we'll probably have some more data. And so I guess the answer to that is stay tuned. In the meantime, do what common sense tells you to do. Oh, the other thing, too, is as you get older, remember, it is very common for your sleep to become fragmented. So if you get over 50, if you get over 55, if you get over 60, if you're over 65, more and more, you're not getting seven hours of sleep. You're getting maybe six, maybe five, and then some naps. That's unfortunately normal. As far as fresh vegetables? Oh, 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 it is, well, let's, let's go through the thing. Um, so meditation could be a, a big part of it, okay? It could be a spiritual component. If you belong to a faith organization, that could be part of it. It could be searching for your purpose. Um, and that might be part of being in a group, or it might not be. You know, I, I know a lot of people who don't belong to a large organization, but they have a sense of purpose. They have a cause. They have something they're crusading for. 
They have something that they believe in that motivates them. They, it's that icky guy. That's it's that reason for getting up in the morning. Why you live? You know, they might be teaching someone karate. I don't. Know. But it's something that that makes you feel like life's worth living. Um, do we know um, the DNA tests that claim that? that they can discover what kind of diet is best for your DNA, like Helix, they claim that you spit into a cup and then the... Yeah, that, that is that. a wonderful topic for your kids' next fifth grade science fair. Okay. I mean, it's a theory. <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, we don't know for sure. If they're telling us the truth. If they're telling us the truth. I don't think they know either if they're honest. It's a, it's a great idea, and, and I think we may get there, but we just don't know. You know it's cool. It's an interesting idea. I wish we had more data, and we will. We'll get there. So I understand it's really the same as you break up your 30 minutes? Yeah, we think so. We think so. Um, you know, even down to, you know, and again, if you believe that app that texted me the little thing from the seven-minute workout, you know, their buzz is if you exercise for seven minutes intensely multiple times, that has great benefit. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, and really when it boils down to the most benefit is in that first 10 minutes of exercise. So, you know, if we were to preach one thing, it's just like, please, just do 10 minutes a day. Just, just do something. Don't be sedentary. A little bit of exercise has huge benefits. And then the more you exercise, the benefit actually tapers off. Um, so it, it, that, that's why there's just tremendous opportunity just to do a little bit. Well, have you seen that in your practice? When you, yeah. yeah. Um, well, do I have a study? Have I plotted it out in a graph? No. But but my gestalt fits the data. Yeah. If, if I look at my patients, and I look at the ones who are 70 years old and ride bikes and exercise and have a purpose in life and are writing books and doing things, man, they're a lot healthier than that guy who's 66 and has his shoulders slumped and says, yeah, I retired last year. I don't know. What are you doing with your life? I don't know. I don't know, my kids have all left, I don't know, my grandkids hate me, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it's, do you know what I mean? Um, and so, so really what we're talking about is not just exercise, we're talking about getting that spark in life back, that icky guy, that, that reason for living. Um, because it's not just about not dying. I mean, that's something that almost all of us are doing right now in this room. We're not dying. We want to live. We want to have a really good life. We want to have those friends that we have for 97 years. How cool is that? You know, we don't want to be alone. We, we want to create those networks of people. That's what makes us happy. Makes life worth living. That's a good place to end. Less than one minute, we're going to keep that. All right, thanks very much.